speakers that have joined us today in the final of a three-part series with the Mandela Institute and Bits University, where we've been focusing on um, the TRIPS waiver and the TRIPS waiver proposal. Um, as you know, we had the first two webinars and the recordings are available on our website. And the first webinar focused on the proposal by South Africa. The second webinar focused on beyond the waiver, the uh, developments and actions that were being taken in Canada, in Colombia, in Brazil, and also in um, and also um, in, in Bolivia and in other parts of the world. Um, and we had some fantastic speakers there as well. So today we really have the honor of uh, Dr. Carlos Correa from the South Center, who's a inspiration and a mentor to many of us in this field. Uh, he will be followed by Tahir Amin, a long-standing medicine access activist and attorney with IMAC and also the co-founder and co-director at IMAX. Yo Yun Kang, uh, who we all know from Twitter, who's a reader in IP law and an IP scholar. Uh, and then that will be followed, uh, she'll be followed by Alex Bailerfeld, who's also at the Mandela Institute at Bits University, and he'll be sharing his screen as well with, with the short presentation. And to conclude and wrap us up this afternoon, uh, we'll be hearing from the formidable Sangeeta from um, Third World Network. Uh, who's also been a key campaigner of the TRIPS waiver proposal and has been really supporting both India and South Africa in, in pursuing this. So I'm going to try and paste the bios in the chat and not too long introductions and I'm going to hand over to Professor Correa. Uh, each presenter will have about eight to ten minutes and then we'll take Q&A at the end. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much and uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Let me let me make a number of observations to introduce the, the issue of the waiver. First, mm -hmm. first let, let me mention that uh, countries historically enjoy the significant flexibility in order to develop their intellectual property systems. Uh, in, for instance, in the case of the United States, the United States denied copyright protection to foreigners until the end of the 19th century. And this was deliberate just to allow for distribution of cheap books in the United States, where copied essentially from UK authors. In 1844, uh, the French patent law was adopted, and the law excluded the patentability of medicines. And this was because of the very nature of medicines as an essential good. And then this policy of exclusion of medicines from patent protection was followed by a large number of countries, including Europe, such as the case of uh, Switzerland, uh, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, also Japan, Latin American countries follow the same approach. So it, it was clear for those who proposed patent protection, which creates a legal monopoly that medicines should be out of such monopolies because of the role that medicines play, or pharmaceuticals in general play. This was possible even in the context of the Paris Convention on, for the Protection of Industrial Property, which uh, was joined by a large number of countries, which uh, does, not, does not limit the policy space of uh, parties to this convention to exclude certain areas from patentability. But this was the situation until a major change in international law uh, took place with adoption of the TRIPS agreement in 1994, it entered into force in general uh, for developing countries in the year 2000, and in particular in relation uh, to pharmaceutical patents in cases there was no prior protection in 2005, as was the case of India. For instance. So this means that uh, the problem we are facing now, and, 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 and one of the reasons why the waiver is under discussion, is because all members of WTO were put under the obligation to grant patents in all fields of technology, including pharmaceuticals. So secondly, the, the nature of patents, as well as, <coughs> as other intellectual property rights, is, is that, as I, as I mentioned before, they confer legal monopolies, they confer exclusive rights. So this means that the patent owner, the owner of the rights, is the only one who can manufacture, who can commercialize, 
and uh, nobody else can do this in the countries where protection is, is granted. Otherwise, there will be an infringement suit and could be some uh, remedies that uh, would be required in, in such a case of infringement. So uh, intellectual property does mean that production can be limited, commercialization of product can be limited, and this is the, the, second, the second problem that uh, um, developing countries in particular and the world as a whole have faced in relation to COVID-19, the limited capacity for manufacturing uh, because of the control of the technology. I, I, will, I will get to that point. So thirdly, patents can be granted in relation to products or processes. In the case of vaccines, as it is known, um, a vaccine uh, includes a, a large number of components, uh, some say about 100 components, maybe part of the vaccine, and not only the vaccine as such may be subject to patent protection, but also many of the components that are part of the vac vaccine development and production could be subject to uh, patents. And in fact, in, in, the, in the era of COVID-19, intellectual property uh, plays a role, um, as, it was, as it was indicated at the very early stages of, of, of the pandemic. For instance, masks have been subject to patent protection, as well as uh, equipment, uh, including not only patents by designs. NIH, for instance, the National Institute of Health of the United States, they got a patent on a stabilized protein of uh, coronavirus that is used in, in many of the, of the vaccines currently under commercialization. Pfizer, to give another example, was sued by a biotech company from Texas because they use in clinical trials a fluorescent protein, which is patented. Moderna has got more than 200 patents in relation to the messenger RNA technology, and some of them specifically on COVID-19. And in addition to this, uh, the TRIPS agreement guarantees um, protection for, for know-how or, or trade secrets or information which may not be patented, but which may be essential for, for manufacturing. So this is, this is uh, why um, the discussion of the, of the one of the reasons why the discussion of the waiver is relevant. Then the, the fourth element is that um, this this control of the technologies have led, as as we know in the case of COVID-19, to uh, to uh, under supply of uh, vaccines. Uh, although there, there is manufacturing capacity, uh, for instance, some plants pro producing biologicals could be uh, converted into plants uh, in order to produce vaccines. One of the main, the main problems to expand the, the capacity to manufacture and supply vaccines has been uh, the lack of access to technology. Um, and this has been the case even, even when some, uh, some companies that had the capacity to, uh, to start production of vaccines requested the owners of this technology uh, license in order to do that, but uh, the, this, this found a refusal from the company. So if you look at, uh, at the information about the transfer of technology or manufacturing contracts uh, entered into by the companies that are now providing vaccines, you will see that uh, Gamaleya, the, the Gamaleya Research Institute has entered into 38 agreements for manufacturing and transfer of technology, most of them for transfer of technology. In the case of AstraZeneca, uh, AstraZeneca entered in 25 agreements, most of them, however, for manufacturing. That means that AstraZeneca still controls the whole process. It is a, a subcontractor is allowed to produce the vaccine, but without having control or, over production or commercialization. Pfizer entered into 19 agreements, most of them, again, manufacturing and not licensing agreements. Novavax, 14 agreements, the same, the, the same characteristic. Uh, Moderna, 12 agreements, none of them transfer of technology, all of them just manufacturing contracts under which uh, the complete uh, cycle of production is under control. Jensen, eight agreements, most of them, again, manufacturing. Sinovac, seven all transfer of technology. So Sinovac is, is an example of a case in which all, all, te all agreements include the transfer of technology. And also uh, this is similar to the case of Bharat Biotech from India, uh, 
which uh, enter into six uh, agreements, most of them transfer of technology. So, the, so if you look at this, so it is quite evident that the Western companies in particular have been quite reluctant to uh, share the technologies. Uh, as you know, in the context of the World Health Organization, a mechanism was established upon uh, um, recommendation from uh, the president of Costa Rica, it's called the CTAP, with the idea of pulling technologies in order to accelerate access to vaccines and other products necessary for addressing COVID-19. But uh, quite evidently, companies have, uh, have refused to, uh, to participate and to, uh, and to put their technologies in, in the pool. And as I mentioned, there were many requests by companies from Bangladesh or Israel or Canada, etc., of uh, voluntary licenses that were not granted by the technology holders. And this is uh, the, the situation, in fact, in terms of undersupply of vaccine, is a reflection of the, of the structure of the vaccine industry. Um, the, the South Center has published an interesting study by Professor Lobo on the structure of the vaccine industry, which shows that uh, if, before COVID-19, the vaccine industry was already oligopolistic in nature, with uh, four or five companies controlling about 80% of the world market. So there is a need to restructure the vaccine industry if we want to face in a different, in a different way uh, future pandemics. And, and I like what is often said, the vaccine industry has been quite profitable. And certainly in, in the context of COVID-19, the companies that have sold vaccines have been extremely profitable. Enormous profits have been made. Uh, on the basis of, of vaccines for, to address uh, COVID-19. Then coming more specifically now to the, to the waiver. So why the waiver is necessary? As I mentioned, because intellectual property rights, in particular patents, must be granted in, in more, practically in all, in all countries, in particular those which are members of WTO. There is an exception, of course, for least developed countries, uh, which has been recently extended. Um, secondly, because intellectual property provides uh, legal monopoly, exclusive rights, which exclude cap the capacity for third parties to enter into production, which will be essential to, to increase the, the supply of vaccines. Um, and, and thirdly, because uh, intellectual property is relevant in relation to products that, um, that relate to COVID-19 possible solutions, whether it's their vaccines or medicines. Uh, as you also know, there, there may be treatments that may be useful to address COVID-19. And again, in this case, you, you will find that uh, patent protection has been sought or will be uh, sought in the future. Then certainly one, uh, one possible approach to this situation is the use of one of the most important flexibilities under the TRIPS agreement. Although the TRIPS agreement, um, that I refer to uh, in the context of the World Health Organization, provides for uh, minimum standards of protection, including patents, it allows for some measures that mitigate the, mono the monopolistic, monopolistic power of the technology owner. And one of these important tools is compulsory license. So compulsory license could be used in a situation like this. This will allow a third party to uh, manufacture um, a particular product which is, which is under, under protection without the consent of the patent owner. But the problem with the use of compulsory license in a situation of emergency like the one we are going through is that uh, in the first place patents are territorial and therefore you will need to, to provide the compulsory license in each territory in which the particular vaccine, if this is the case, is manufactured or sold. Secondly, um, compulsory license applies to granted patents. And since uh, COVID-19 is, is too recent, there, there may be a number of uh, patent applications, which at one point may be published, but we are still unknown, and uh, in respect of which uh, compulsory license will not work, but at, at one point the, the patent may be granted. Uh, thirdly, it, it is difficult to, uh, to identify, and probably Tahir will talk about this, to map uh, the situation of, uh, of patents in a particular sector because companies very often do not describe fully what the technology is in order to prevent uh, 
um, oppositions or to make a search more difficult. Therefore, it will be quite difficult for governments to identify, even to identify which are the patterns that are relevant. If, for instance, the production of vaccine with so many components is envisaged. Uh, fourthly, uh, granting, granting a compulsory license requires uh, legal procedures, which is, in some cases are quite long and complicated, um, in particular in cases in which a decision to grant a compulsory license may be appealed by the patent owner. So this may delay enormously the execution of the compulsory license if, if, if in particular, a decision by a court is necessary. Um, for instance, uh, in the case of, of Canada, um, there is there has been a request by Biolize Pharma of um, compulsory license under the Canadian law uh, that has implemented um, the, the previous waiver in relation to the CHIPS agreement. There is an interesting paper by Professor Mohammad Abbas published by the South Centre about this case. And since March uh, 2021, uh, the company has uh, unable to move forward with this with this request. So this shows that procedures are long, and this is why why a waiver has has become uh, an important solution because the waiver will accelerate uh, the the manufacturing of uh, of vaccines. Uh, the waiver will give legal certainty, and this is very important because. Uh, this will mean if the waiver is adopted, this will mean that uh, any any manufacturer, for instance, now producing biologicals, might move into the production of vaccines without the risk of having an infringement suite and then be stopped on the basis of an injunction which is uh, granted by a court. So the waiver would be extremely important to accelerate uh, manufacturing and distribution of vaccines, as, as we know has been completely unequal in, in this context. So th that's why the waiver was proposed in the first place by, by South Africa and India, as we know, has a very large support from, from developing countries and also from uh, some developed countries, although uh, as we probably discussed during this webinar, uh, some developed countries, in particular the European Union, continue to oppose to it. So adopting the waiver will uh, facilitate, will accelerate uh, access to um, vaccines to the extent that it will provide the legal certainty for um, companies that now have the capacity to do that and, and um, eventually in this in this way increase the, the supply. And then my last word is that uh, hopefully the way it will be approved and if this is the case, it will be important for, uh, for developing countries in particular to immediately consider the measures that will be necessary in order to implement the waiver, because the waiver will just prevent actions from other members of WTO, but there will be a need to implement national measures. It could be executive orders, it could be changes in legislation, as the one introduced recently by Brazil, for instance, in order to allow for the waiver to be operational in at the national level. Well, thank you very much again for your kind invitation. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Correa. Uh, also just uploaded the references to the papers that you mentioned in your talk in the chat box. Um, and for those of you who are joining again, you've just heard from Professor Carlos Correa from the South Center, who's the director there. Uh, just giving us the context of where we are in relation to the TRIPS waiver proposal. As you all know, it's now just over a year since the proposal was first made uh, by India and South Africa, and uh, the rest of the speakers will also take you through the number of co-sponsors and, and, and the supporters for, for the proposal. So our next speaker is going to be Tahir Amin. Tahir, over to you. Thank you, uh, Fatima. Thank you, uh, Dr. Correa. Um, so I, I looked at the title of this uh, event and I thought it gave me permission to maybe take this conversation in a slightly broader way. Um, you know, we think about the way forward on the TRIPS waiver and what happens next. I think about what's happened in the last 18 months uh, historically. And uh, it takes me back to a, um, a time when I was in India in 2004. I had just left the commercial world of uh, IP and uh, I joined a small nonprofit there and I was in conversation with some Global South 
uh, access to medicines activists, but also intellectual property researchers and scholars. And the conversation was India was about to um, implement its uh, 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 compliance with the TRIPS agreement. And the conversation was around, oh, we're being recolonized. And what's been interesting has been the uh, the language that has emerged uh, over the last 18 months as we've seen the sort of uh, the, the mask slip off the the trips agreement and what it was designed to be i think uh, carlos touched on some of those aspects and um, and what i think is important is how we go forward from here is is uh, is the language that we will use and i think language is really important I, you know i want to quote from George Lakoff, who's a cognitive linguist and philosopher, who says language works by activating the brain structures called frame circuits used to understand experience. They get stronger when we hear activating language. Enough repetition can make them permanent, changing how we view the world. So my, my, I think the question I would like to pose to the other panelists, but also uh, the, the, what those of us who've been in this field for a long time, is how, what kind of language will we continue to use? Uh, as we move through this uh, trips waiver, but even beyond it, for example, even if we, even if the waiver is not successful, do we go and revert back to the language we have been using? And this is where I want to sort of go back 25 years, because having lived through this last sort of quarter of a century, um, and going back to the, the the conversation I was having with colleagues back in India, where we were talking about, oh, is, is the global South being recolonized because of the trips agreement? What soon happened was we changed language from really uh, talking about the, the sort of uh, recolonization or the, uh, the sort of neo-colonialist uh, sort of structures of the TRIPS agreement to then starting to talk about flexibilities. And it's understandable why that happens, because when something happens, you have to live in that moment and you have to try and find ways to uh, to, in, to to try and tackle it. Um, and as, as we started talking about trips flexibilities, I remember being in India and, and we were trying to use those flexibilities. We started challenging patterns. We started, India changed its laws. Other countries were trying to build in public health safeguards. But around 2008, uh, um, we started to move from flexibilities to voluntary mechanisms. And so not e we didn't even have time to really implement these flexibilities because what happened was, and, and I'm going to be critical of no one ind uh, individual institution or whatever, but whether it be funders, whether it be Global North NGOs, whether it be the desire to try and get medicines to as many people as possible, given the structures that had been implemented, we started then talking about voluntary measures. And so already within the space of a decade, at least from when India was really kind of facing its uh, changing laws, but this is for everyone. We went from sort of really talking about almost structures of colonialism or neo-colonialism to then voluntary measures that we were asking for handout. And I think that's really a, a lesson. Um, there was a good article in The Atlantic just this weekend about sort of the downfall of public health. And so when I see this trajectory of language of how we gone away from our core because we were asked to innovate by funders like Unitate and what have you to come up with these voluntary measures. We've actually moved away from the core issues that what these TRIPS agreement was about. And that's not to blame anyone, but that is for us to reflect upon as in terms of how we will move forward from here after the aftermath or whilst we are still living this pandemic. And so it, it for me, it's interesting because there has been a reemergence of the term decolonizing global health, which is have been happening sort of largely since the Ebola crisis, I believe. And it's not a new term, but it's, it's actually people talking about health structures, health systems, funders, who owns, who control what. And I think uh, if we are really to move forward uh, and use this opportunity that the TRIPS waiver has presented, it's going to be important is how we speak about it. Uh, it's been quite telling the language that has come up in throughout the last 18 months of people talking about neo-colonial structures, apartheid, global south, all these terms which we had forgotten and maybe, you know, language reappears because of the times that we live in. And we're seeing that in, you know, in terms of just wokeness and just generally. And so for me, it's, it's, I think it will be a catastrophic error if we go back to speaking their language of flexibilities and voluntary measures. Naturally, they will exist, but we need to create a new language that is going to actually make us realize that if we are really to evolve from these structures, we have to start uh, framing them in the ways that 
ultimately what this is really about. And I think this pandemic has shown that. And it the only way forward, if we want to really uh, uh, use this effort uh, to kind of realize some of the changes that are desperately needed, uh, it would be to change the language that we talk. I think if we go back to re reverting back to what exists, and I know it's hard because that's how our minds are wired now. Uh, it's on all of us to actually uh, uh, start a new language. So I'm just going to leave it there. It's more of a provocative uh, point I'm making, if maybe not provocative, uh, but just something to think about. Because uh, for me, uh, when I uh, when I think about even terms like innovation, it's uh, these are terms that are, are framing what the other side wants. And I think it's important for us to re reframe this whole debate, which is happening, but we need to stay on that track. Thank you. Thank you, Tahir. And I think that the issues around colonialism and voluntary measures is going to resonate very much with what you and Sangeeta are going to present. Uh, but before that, uh, I think we're going to hear from um, Alex. Um, and then after Alex, we'll hear from Yo and, and Sangeeta. So I know that Alex has to share his screen as well. Uh, and, and I think it's also going to touch on possible measures that don't rely on voluntary cooperation and, and uh, agreement of, of member states. So over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Fatima. Um, all right, let me share my screen. Um, all right. Let's just get to the slideshow there. So, okay. So Ask the you, people who are not uh, speaking or to please mute themselves and to mute their video. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you can you see my screen, uh, Fatima? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. OK, excellent. Um, so perhaps, uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, to, to both Tahir and, and Carlos for, for setting the scene so nicely. Um, I should um, should mention at the beginning that I'm not an IP lawyer. I'm more of a trade lawyer. And so I've learned a lot throughout this webinar series and continue to learn today. And, and you know, uh, the, the insights that have been offered have been really sort of instructive for me. So um, it's, it's been great. Thank you, guys. Uh, maybe some background context to this presentation, which I've titled The COVID-19 Pandemic and Essential Security Interests. Um, thoughts on Article 73 of the TRIPS agreement, we'll, we'll get in a moment to what that is, is, you know, um, in the earlier webinars, the issue was raised, and I think at the sort of outset of the pandemic, the issue was also quite a live one. Uh, well, what about, you know, essential security interests in the, in the TRIPS agreement? Does it uh, allow us to take the same types of measures that one would envision taking uh, once a waiver is passed without the waiver. Uh, and I think basically the, the context here is just to say, well, let's try and answer that question. Um, I think maybe maybe that ship has sailed a little bit, but it's um, I think it's still a question that, that people have an interest in. And so I'm going to have a, have a look at that question today. So what what is Article 73 of the TRIPS agreement? Uh, it goes to to essential security interests. So it says, uh, as you can see on the screen, nothing in this agreement shall be construed to prevent a member from taking any action which it considers necessary for the protection of its essential security interests. Uh, so before we move on to the next phrase, as you can see, uh, the wording of, of Article 73 uh, is, you know, in, in this context, the, the first part of it at least is fairly self-judging. So it's for nations to decide for themselves what they think is necessary for the protection of their essential security interests. So I think Article 73 on its plain language sort of allows countries to frame for themselves uh, what, what their essential security interests are and to sort of assert what they think is necessary uh, to protect those interests. But then, then comes the snag, and I think that's where, you know, the, the real legal analysis would would um, come in for this particular issue is, you know, it must be taken in a time of war or other emergency in international relations. And so much of the focus that I'm, you know, that I'm going to, much of what I'm going to pay attention today is, is on that phrase, uh, because I think that would be the, the phrase that, you know, 
brings this article into operation or not in this particular context. So, you know, is the COVID-19 pandemic uh, it's certainly not taken in, in time of war, or at least not global war, but is it an other emergency in international relations? So there's some WTO case law on this. I don't have an awful lot of time to, to traverse uh, the exact sort of legal tests and so forth, but there is a panel report in the Saudi Arabia intellectual property rights case, which endorses a previous approach taken, uh, more or less endorses a previous approach taken by the panel in Russia, traffic and transit, which wasn't in relation to TRIP specifically, but uh, was in, in relation to Article 21b3 of GATT, which sort of serves a, fim uh, a similar purpose in relation to the GATT. So the panel adopts this four-step analytical framework. Sort of the first step of that that I'm interested in here, which is whether there is in fact the existence of a war or other emergency in international relations in the sense of subparagraph three to article 73B of TRIP. So, so that's sort of the main focus here. I think the other three uh, prongs of, of, of the analytical framework are um, are interesting and you know it's necessary to to give some consideration to them in potentially framing measures based or rooted in on Article 73B, but I, I don't think they pose particularly interesting sort of legal questions. So uh, I've put them there on the slide and um, please please do take a look at them if the slides are circulated. I think they will be, uh, but I'm going to focus on the first one. Um, and in, in that regard, the panel in Saudi Arabia intellectual property rights uh, says that this phrase war or other emergency in international relations is, is a question of objective fact, first of all. So while we frame essential security interests uh, in, in a subjective sense, countries for themselves can decide w what is in their essential security interests. That's not necessarily the same when it comes to whether, in fact, a war or other emergency in international relations exists. So uh, I've put a quote there from, from what follows on from that, which is, you know, while political and economic conflicts could sometimes be considered urgent and serious, in a political sense, such conflicts will not be emergencies in international relations within the meaning of subparagraph three, um, of course, being a reference to, to 73B. Um, and it, then, of course, the important bit, unless they give rise to defense and military interests or maintenance of law and public order interests. So you can see there that the panel sort of has read Article 73 in a fairly narrow sense. So it sees international uh, and, uh, and other emergency in international relations in a, in a way that's sort of related to war almost, you know, um, it must give rise to implications of defense and military interests or maybe maintenance of, of law and public order interests. So with that in mind, with that narrow question in mind, one could ask, you know, has the panel gotten this correct uh, with the appellate body currently um, being incapacitated um, as it is? We're, we're not going to see the case appealed um, or resolved by way of appeal anytime soon. Um, so I, I think, you know, it's still open for, for question whether the appellate body would see it the same way. And if one were to you know, base a measure in Article 73 and it were to be challenged, you know, would it, uh, would a decision by a panel actually come into effect? Uh, those, are, those are questions, but sort of pr presuming that the panel has uh, given us what the law is in, in some way or another, um, I, there are some questions and thoughts that I'd like to offer, and it'd be interesting to get the other panelists take on this as well. So first, you know, has the COVID-19 pandemic given rise to warlike to a warlike situation, and or does it implicate public order? Uh, I think Dr. Correa uh, Carlos did write in a letter at the, at the outset of the pandemic, uh, relying on on section uh, sorry Article 73 of the TRIPS Agreement to to a number of international organizations, but this was prior to waiver discussions, uh, sort of saying, well, countries have have the right in a pandemic, perhaps to to violate the TRIPS agreement or not to violate the TRIPS agreement because the TRIPS agreement wouldn't even come into play. Um, and I think, you know, there are some similarities, perhaps. I mean, for a start, in, in terms of 
of casualties, the loss of human life. In that sense, we're already in a warlike situation almost where countries around the world are all operating in extremely unusual circumstances and a large amount of people have, have died. I think we're up to uh, close to, to 5 million people globally. Uh, just to give one sort of anecdote to, to sort of explain how, how that is the case. In the United States, I think we're approaching 750,000 deaths uh, which is almost twice as many people uh, as died in the Second World War in the United States, uh, civilians and, and soldiers inclusive. So in that regard, perhaps, you know, we have this very extreme situation where countries are closing down their borders. Um, they're imposing, in some, in some cases, economic, um, sorry, uh, export restrictions. They're taking measures to to protect their populations, and a large number of people are, are dying. So in, in that sense, you know, it's not too different, but I, I think, you know, as I'll get to in a moment, it's perhaps not the most useful way to conceptualize it in order to solve the problem that the waiver is looking to solve. So that, that brings me to this question, if so, you know, uh, is it useful to conceptualize the COVID pandemic as being warlike. And that raises a number of, of sub-questions. I'll just add them to the screen. Um, and then perhaps um, we can chat about them a bit later as well. Um, but, you know, first of all, if you relied on Article 73, would it render the waiver unnecessary in a legal sense? I mean, it, it's arguable, um, perhaps, but, you know, I think it, it could probably go either way. And then I've added there, what about legal certainty? I know Carlos mentioned that in, in his talk. And I think, you know, um, whether the waiver is unnecessary in a legal sense or not, uh, the waiver would, would certainly bring about legal certainty, whereas reliance on Article 73 might not do that, particularly in light of the next question, which is would WTO members utilize dispute settlement proceedings? in relation to measures taken uh, that are based on Article 73. And then I've put there in brackets, and what about the, the AB? What about the appellate body? Uh, so the appellate body is currently not functioning. So if a dispute went through the system, uh, w would it give rise to further legal uncertainty, even if a panel were to resolve it, for example? Um, I think, uh, yeah, there are a number of of other interesting considerations there, but uh, I'm, I'm not going to take them much further right now. Maybe uh, we can we can think about them um, when we when we do the Q and A. Uh, I think the next one then is: Would it be more proactive? Uh, would it be a more proactive approach to forcing the issue? So I think this sort of goes to the language issue to some degree uh, that that Taiho was raising, uh, which is sort of this this you know, issue of do we have the right to take these measures or are we asking in some way for permission to take them? Um, it, you know, if you take an Article 73 approach, you are sort of saying, well, the TRIPS agreement allows me to do this. And, you know, we've all agreed that it allows me to do this and therefore I am doing it. Whereas the waiver is saying, you know, can we all please agree that we are allowed to do this to, to some degree? So, I think, you know, perhaps if you were to go the Article 73 route, you could have acted a bit more swiftly um, and more decisively uh, on, the, on the basis that, you know, we have a right to do what we want to do. But then, of course, that raises the issue of would all of this result in a tit-for-tat situation? And I think this is where you begin to hit some snags, um, because if one country declares that particular measures are, you know, taken for their essential security interests, then other countries will surely follow suit. And I'm not sure that that's conducive to um, to getting the planet vaccinated uh, as quickly as, as possible. So then just a few more questions before I close. Um, do WTO members who want to rely on this approach have the necessary domestic laws in place? I think Carlos also touched on this. So the idea is, you know, if if you were to take an Article 73 approach, or if even if you were to have taken it earlier, uh, would the necessary domestic laws and domestic measures have been in place to take advantage of such an approach? 
I certainly know, speaking from a South African approach uh, or from a South African context, I think the answer to that question is no. Our domestic laws are probably not up to scratch to take proper advantage of this approach. Um, at least I think that that was uh, what was presented in previous webinars. Uh, and then, you know, there's always the question of domestic manufacturing uh, as well, which uh, Carlos also uh, touched on quite uh, extensively. And then, you know, the last two questions are, will taking this approach be harmful to cooperation and solidarity? And, you know, will, will it result in, in tech, tech transfer, which is also quite important. And I think, you know, in both of those instances, probably you would want to answer no. So I think for me, at the end of the day, um, Article 73 is quite a useful lens to view, to view the problem, perhaps. Um, but if you root measures in it, I think, you know, um, it's, they're less likely to be to be effective than efforts um, such as the proposed waiver that are aimed at fostering cooperation and, and solidarity. So, yeah, with that, I thank you. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. OK, so thanks, Alex. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions related to that. And, you know, obviously in the Q&A, we'll, we'll first give uh, some of the panelists a chance to respond to that. Um, because obviously a lot of people are getting sick and dying, particularly on the continent where we are. And so the issue of political will in leadership is, is I think, paramount and critical, not just of leaders in the global south, but leaders in the global north as well. So somebody who's been really prolific in condemning and writing about colonialism and also racism in the response to COVID, particularly in the way in which IP is misused uh, to advance an agenda of knowledge hoarding has been Yo Yun Kang. Um, and so, Yo, uh, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. So um, first of all, thank you very much for convening this panel and I'm honored to be part of this panel with so many um, people that I admire. Um, so I just want to get back to what Tahir has said about the language um, that has been really prominent uh, over the last 18 months of the TRIPS waiver debate um, and the, the wording of flexibility. So just to go back to that, I think what has become really apparent over the last 18 months is that the trips and the promises of the trips have actually not crystallized as hoped and that the promises of the trips have been failed. So I'm in particularly I'm thinking about Article 7 objectives of the trips and Article 8 principles of the trips, which incorporate the principle of development um, as well as the promise of tech transfer. And I think what the debacle of the TRIPS waiver has shown is that it has come to a point where people accept that these principles have actually been ignored at the expense of other principles, such as pet monopolies and other knowledge monopolies. So in a way, the balance that the TRIPS was supposed to achieve um, has not been achieved. And um, the imbalance that this has um, well, this has actually been carried out for a long time before the pandemic has been normalized to such a degree that the waiver is seen as something which goes beyond and above the normal trips obligations. So that's something um, that's a point that I really appreciate that has been mentioned um, by I think all three panelists um, who have actually spoken before me. And I think that's something that where really the scholarship IP scholarship needs to come in and try to really query, um, you know, this kind of normality and and kind of you know reflect back on the politics of the trips, um, especially since the Doha development agenda. To what degree this has been failed? Um, I wanted to concentrate my talk on um, on a more or less I think um, scholarly perspective, um, and I think what I have experienced over the last 18 months together with my co-authors, um, and I want to actually mention them by name because we have worked very intensively together over the last year. So that's um, Ashling McMahon, Shiva Tambisati, Luke uh, McDonough, and Graeme Dutfield, um, is that there is a certain role of scholarship that we don't want to overestimate, but also not underestimate. And I want to query the relationship of scholarship and especially 
the role and ethos of critical scholarship in relation to policy and what is happening now. Um, I think just to kind of recap what has happened was that, um, you know, over a year ago, South Africa and India have put forward the TRIPS waiver proposal. And then I think in the time before that, it, at least from my personal perspective, I was trying to see what is going to happen because COVAX was proposed in May 2020. CTAP, the beginning of which was already intimated by the president of Costa Rica end of March 2020, so even before the COVAX, um, all of these things were kind of hanging in the air. And then um, in October 2020, South Africa and India proposed um, a temporary waiver of the TRIPS obligations. And then for a long time, I think people were trying to think about if it would make sense, how it would work, um, if it would actually help to accelerate vaccine production as well as access. And then, you know, we also have to remember that at, at that time we actually did not have um, any vaccines approved and uh, we were hoping for the scientists and the companies to come through and for the approvals to be granted in terms of their efficacy and safety. Uh, once that was done and um, the industrialized nations were starting to vaccinate the healthcare workers as well as the most vulnerable, I think it was by around February, February 2021, so it's still this year, it feels a long time ago, um, that I realized that um, the equitable access or uh, any attempt at global coordination um, was going very slowly. And I remember that I published a blog, blog post linking the, um, the implication of IP law, transnational IP law in the overall financial system um, that came out in February. And then my colleague Shiva Tambisati actually published on the same date, um, reminding states of their obligation of tech transfer and um, developmental obligations. Um, and so that was all in February. And then I think three months later, it was the 5th of May in which, uh, on which Ambassador Tay um, had announced uh, qualified support by, of the US government for the trip waiver proposal, um, which was, I think, a big surprise to many of us and, and, and for us really a turning point. And then two days later, um, a prominent IP research institution on the continent, on, in continental Europe, published a position paper saying that the waiver proposal would not really help to accelerate um, vaccine production. It would not be the right solution. There are, the compulsory license provisions are sufficient. Um, and it, was, it argued against the trip waiver proposal. And that was really for us quite a surprising move in the sense that um, traditionally the scholarship of IP is a very is seen to be a very technical field, um, not very politicized. And um, and of course, I mean, there were always colleagues who have been at the forefront um, of access to health and uh, an IP loss implication in, um, in difficulty of achieving that. But, but, you know, by large and large, the IP scholarly field is a field dominated by dogmatic scholarship as well as law and econ methodology. So it assumes that the law is there for a certain kind of policy purpose to balance um, different incentives and rewards. But it's, it's highly, um, it's highly it seen to be very technical and expert oriented. So the 7th of May position paper by the European, um, by a certain European research institute, and I don't think I need to really call names because many of you know which position paper I'm talking about, has really kind of rattled many of us who were in favor of the waiver position as uh, what we thought would be a proportional and necessary response um, towards a global coordination and towards the lifting of monopoly obligations in a, in a temporary manner for the duration of the pandemic. It has really rattled us together and brought us in a way um, probably that we didn't expect it would happen, to be honest, um, prior to the pandemic. So, so that was when me and my colleagues, um, so Ashling, Luke, Shiva and Graham had um, intensively worked on a paper in order to bring a very thorough and comprehensive case um, in favor of the TRIPS waiver. 
and we published that as a LSE working paper on the 24th of May. So all of this was happening in May, which was about five months ago. It feels much longer. Now, what happened afterwards is quite interesting because we, we saw a strong pushback um, by the EU in the meantime, which used exactly the language of the of that particular position paper, um, which argued against the waiver. And we also saw some um, other patent professional institutions, such as the Central Institute of Patent Agents in the UK. Then there's another institution which I've actually never heard about, but they call themselves a patent research institution in France, um, arguing against the waiver and calling academics who are in favor of the waiver and making a case for it, um, ideologues rather than experts. And um, as I was you know, talking with journalists, they said, we get the impression that most patent experts are against the waiver, um, as well as academics. Can you explain why that is and why do you think that the waiver proponents are irrational? So there was an interesting bifurcation of um, of one side as being the rational experts and the other side as being the irrational emotional ideologues. And, um, and that's why we thought it was necessary to show that actually IP experts and scholars are quite divided on the issue of the TRIPS waiver. And that's why we wrote an academic open letter making a case in support of the TRIPS IP waiver proposal. And we have over 200 Actually, I have to update this, but we have almost, I think, over 200 signatories, um, all of which are um, IP experts or related to IP um, to express their support in favor of it. And that was, we really saw it was, we didn't actually want to do this a, at the beginning because we thought that the position paper which solicited signatories was quite divisive. Um, so we did not want to act in the same way, but um, after fielding so many calls from journalists to say that the IP experts are against the waiver, we had actually no other choice than to do this in order to show a more balanced um, reflection of what the experts thought. So in some way it rectified the one-sided perception of IP academics view. And um, it also actually taught me that going forward, there are lessons to be learned from this, um, regardless of how the waiver um, proposal will be decided upon at the WTO, um, which I think should we should learn from the divergent expertise of IP scholars in this way. So first of all, I think it's important to underline that no research and no research output is neutral. Um, but I think the better research is more thorough and comprehensive and contextual. It doesn't just look at the text of the law and, and produces a dogmatic analysis or an annotated case commentary. Um, then I think also there is a need for critical and contextual IP scholarship. And I know that one is not exclusive of one another. So there can be a very good technical legal analysis together with a historical, critical and contextual IP scholarship that goes beyond purely is doctrinal analysis. Um, there are also topics that need substantial debunkings, in my opinion. Um, the, the first one is the most pernicious myth of innovation, and Tahir has actually talked about innovation as well as being somehow being mythically linked to the idea of IP and inventions. Um, I think Graham might Graeme Dutfield, my colleague, has said, um, innovation is an innovation if it doesn't actually benefit um, the public at large. And I think I fully agree with him there. I think we need to think about um, who innovation benefits and who the public is, um, who patent law is supposed to benefit, because patent law is there not for a reason, I mean, not for a monopoly reason, for just for the sake of monopoly. It's supposed to benefit the public at large. and in the current structure of the TRIPS, I think we have to think about who that global public is and who benefits from those particular monopolies. I think what the pandemic has shown is that some publics benefit more than others, um, although the monopoly also benefits more, some more than others. So in a way, the, the, the system is really not um, working in an equitable way. Um, last, lastly, I think um, this is something which 
I think also um, it's, you know, it's it, it really something that uh, we in our discipline need to reflect upon. I think um, global health advocates and global health academics um, and IP scholars actually need to work more closely together because I think um, we know that IP law is not just legal, it's also political. But also on the other hand, I think access to health cannot be achieved without some substantial rethinking of the IP law myths and premises. And I think this is something what has become very, very clear over the last 18 months. So that's something um, to be worked on in the future. That's it from me, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And we've just uh, added the references to uh, what you mentioned in your um, input in the chat box. We're now going to hand over to Sangeeta, our final speaker, who I think um, you know it represents that merger of IP scholarship and activism. Um, so, and and I think will be really useful, Sangeeta, to also in in your uh, remarks to also reflect on what you and and Tai here has, has said around language and then also some of the proposals uh, and input from Carlos and uh, Alex as well. And then we will probably have about 45 minutes for a Q&A conversation. Uh, we have speaking order already. There's a person called KB who will be able to ask the first question. And so if you do want to ask questions, if you can indicate that in the chat box, I'll keep a list and then we'll open it to the panelists. So, Thank you so much, Sangeeta. I know you, you're doing the work on the ground in terms of actually advocating for the TRIPS waiver, so making time for this is, is uh, really taking time out of that, but we do appreciate it and welcome and over to you. Thanks. Uh, you are muted. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Fatima, also to the organizers for having me on the panel. So we have today the TRIPS waiver. The TRIPS waiver, it was mentioned, um, it's, it's supported, it's co-sponsored by 64 uh, developing countries, uh, including the Africa group. Uh, it is supported, generally supported by the majority of the WTO membership. I think we are at a time in the discussion in the WTO, a very critical moment. Uh, in one month, there will be WTO ministerial conference. Um, and so there is a lot of pressure, at least I'd like to think a lot of pressure on the WTO to show that it can de deliver a, 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 a credible response uh, with respect to the pandemic. And I think at the top of the agenda, at least from the developing countries, is the TRIPS waiver. I think the challenge uh, is really to get a meaningful outcome uh, amidst really strong opposition uh, from a few WTO members, and in particular, the European Union. Now, having said that, what I wanted to do is maybe highlight uh, four opportunities, I think, uh, with respect to access that arise from, that I think arise from this TRIPS waiver discussion. So firstly, I think the discussions on the TRIPS waiver proposal have very importantly brought to the fore uh, the access challenges posed by intellectual property from the perspective of developing countries. And I think more specifically, an understanding of how the intellectual property requirements of the World Trade Organization uh, can impact equitable access. Now, we normally think about equitable access more around you know, high prices of, of, of medicines and treatments, uh, but actually, you know, I think in the, in the context of COVID, uh, and and even in other contexts as well, you know, the equi when we talk about equ equitable access, it's really about timely availability and affordability of medical products. Now, these issues are not new. The issues around affordability, um, high prices, you know, uh, we have seen that in the context of HIV, HEPs, hepatitis C, um, cancer. Uh, in 2001, you know, the discussion around high prices and, you know, the, the discussion around its Im the impact of intellectual property on affordability led to the 2001 Doha Declaration on uh, TRIPS and Public Health. Now, this declaration reaffirmed uh, that countries have the possibility of uh, using TRIPS flexibilities, but the reality is that despite that declaration and the agreement that countries have that flexibility, 
there has been, I think in the last one decade, um, a lot of pressure on countries uh, not to do so. And where countries have done so, you know, they have faced uh, threats of sanctions, harassment, bullying, uh, not just by developed countries, the US and EU in particular, but also from the industry. I just want to very quickly highlight, like for instance, in 2017, when Malaysia issued its compulsory license uh, to import more affordable hepatitis C medicines from Egypt, um, you know, they came under an, a lot of pressure actually to abandon the compulsory license uh, from Gilead, from the US officials, um, and, and it was also remarked in the EU documents. So there has been a lot of pressure on countries not to use this flexibility. And I think the TRIPS waiver also comes as a response to that, that whenever countries have tried to use that flexibility, they have come under immense pressure. So in a global emergency, such as the current one, it just makes sense that, you know, we should create full freedom to operate and collaborate by lifting the intellectual property monopolies. And I think in the context um, in the in, in the context of the trips waiver, it has really created greater global awareness, um, not just about limited access to vaccines and therapeutics, but just limited access to medical tools generally in developing countries, and how intellectual property can also impact that uh, with respect to masks, PPEs, ventilators, uh, various medical devices. And I think this presents the visibility given by the TRIPS waiver proposal presents a really good opportunity for advocacy and policy change at the international level, but also at the national level to ensure that intellectual property laws and you know, related systems are aligned to national needs and develop, uh, national, to access and development needs. So this brings me to my next point. Uh, typically uh, before COVID-19, I think a lot of the discussion on the impact on intellectual property has centered around patents and access to medicines. Uh, but the, in the current context of COVID, the, the ongoing disparity in access to a wide range of medical products and the TRIPS waiver proposal that covers across all health technologies, I think has increased awareness that the issues and concerns of intellectual property go beyond patents. And this was also mentioned um, by, by speakers before me, it extends to trade secret, there are issues around copyright, there are issues around industrial design. So if you look at the manufacturing standards, the process for vaccines and biologics, they're protected by trade secret and, and even protected by national regulatory authorities because this information is contained in regulatory dossiers which are then protected as trade secrets. In 2020, there was the issue, uh, the, the case where because of shortage of supply of ventilators, uh, ventilator valves, there was 3D printing of ventilator valves. And, you know, th there were legal firms that issued um, uh, notice that, you know, this can actually lead to various violations of patents, copyright and industrial designs. And in India, actually, in one case uh, of Roche, the originator company asserted copyright infringement with respect to the, the package insert use of the product information of the originator. This was in the case uh, of Herceptin breast cancer treatment, where, where Roche was asserting copyright infringement for using the same kind of product information in a biosimilar product. So this really highlights the importance of ensuring that various intellectual property law uh, contain sufficient policy space to, re to respond to national needs, uh, including during a national emergency. So, my third point is really that what the pandemic has really truly revealed is that uh, production and supply of medical products, as well as inputs needed for manufacturing is heavily concentrated. Uh, and it, this is reinforced by intellectual property monopolies that erect barriers for new entrants. Uh, if you look at the data, the statistics, the world's top 10 exporting Economies supplied three quarters of world trade of COVID-19 critical products. Uh, and, and as we saw global demand exceed global supply, uh, developing countries were being priced out of access to this COVID-19 medical, COVID-19 products. So UNCTED, the UN Conference on Trade and Development found that uh, in, by, in October 2020, that for each resident, of um, in high income countries, they had benefited on average from 
per month of imports of COVID-19 um, related products. While in middle income country, you know, on average they benefited at $1 and for lower income countries at 10 cents. So the, the, the kind of the disparity in access is really staggering. So here it's quite clear there is a need not just to expand production, but to diversify production and supply options. And you know, as was mentioned, this is really the basic premise of the TRIPS waiver proposal, as we have heard. It was also mentioned that you know, a common argument we hear is that there is no manufacturing capacity in developing countries. I think there have been now several reports that have proven this argument to be false. But I think importantly, even before COVID, um, many of WHO's pre-qualified vaccine across different platforms are actually from developing country manufacturers. And I think developing country manufacturers uh, were really uh, the main suppliers of vaccines for a lot of the developing countries. Um, you know, and, and I think this is what we see from the data of WHO. Now, another argument as was heard was that, you know, intellectual property is not an issue. Uh, and what is puzzling that this narrative is repeated, uh, you know, constantly. Uh, and it was mentioned, and I think uh, the the letter that was mentioned that was put forward by the IP academics actually countered this very well. Um, another fact is also the that Pfizer, in its various contracts with governments, uh, in itself has obtained IP waiver from potential risk of infringement. So that if there was such a you know case of infringement and it was liable, it would be the governments that bear responsibility liability and not Pfizer. So at the heart of this uh, manufacturing um, supply is really how we deal with intellectual property issues. Um, in any case, I think what is clear is there is a need for developing countries to invest, to support local and regional production, and importantly, to ensure that the intellectual property, as well as other laws and policies and practices, and these are all relate, interrelated on procurement, on medicine regulation, that they are all supportive of the entry of local manufacturers. So I think this is, uh, you know, it, it is it is really ensuring that there is that kind of conducive environment for local manufacturing to thrive. And I actually want to make the final point I'd like to make is that, you know, in a global emergency, and we are in a global emergency, and we know now that we have a virus that can mutate uh, and it's going to do what it does best, which is evade vaccine efficacy. And we have heard repeatedly that um, uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And yet access is really dependent, global access is dependent on the willingness of Big Pharma to provide voluntary licenses. And, you know, Tahir has gone through how now a lot of the discussion is around voluntary licenses. But what we have seen in this pandemic is in most cases, they have been very reluctant to do so. And despite all the talk about num the numerous technology transfer agreement that exist, the reality is that most production has been in-house. I think about 73% of production has been in-house and tightly controlled by the originators. And so what we are seeing is really supply is artificially being constrained. And Big Pharma has also exercised its power to decide who should get access, who should not get, and the terms of such access. And uh, this is really against the background of the millions and millions, I think $100 million of public funding that has supported product development for Big Pharma, and the billions that are being made in profit, uh, you know, by, 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 this, especially by these companies. Uh, through advanced purchase agreements, and they have prioritized supply to high-income countries because at the heart of it is that their main aim is not really access, but to make a maximum profits. So I think we are in the current situation where we really need to rethink whether the current IP system, the TRIPS agreement, is really fit for purpose. Uh, we have, um, and this is again going back to what Tahir was saying, you know, uh, we really have to see whether the current, are we going to go back to the situation that was there before? Uh, you know, we have already struggled with, you know, this mechanism that was developed uh, 
uh, with respect to export to countries with insufficient manufacturing capacity, Article 31 bis. This was alluded by uh, to by Carlos. Uh, it's cumbersome. It's difficult to use. Uh, I think we have had that discussion for uh, since 2003 when it was first agreed to, you know, uh, and we have seen that currently, even in the current context, BioLease has struggled to make use of Article 31 base in Bolivia, despite the notification happening in February or March, is still waiting for its vaccines from BioLease. So I think this brings us, you know, to that conclusion. Now, beyond uh, this current TRIPS waiver proposal, you know, we really need to rethink whether the current um, uh, ecosystem, you know, that we are that is surrounding on intellectual property and its relationship to access. I think we really need to consider, uh, ask the question whether it's really fit for purpose and what changes need to be made. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sangeeta. And I think like really powerful reminder about the situation of scarcity and the situation of unilateral decision-making in the middle of a global pandemic. And we just saw that this morning both with the announcements from Moderna and Pfizer as well, uh, which I'm hoping the panel will reflect on. Um, so if we could ask all the panelists to switch on their videos, I think that will help us to begin the, the conversation in the Q&A. Um, we do have a hand from KB, but, but before we take the question from KB, and if you, KB, if you wouldn't mind actually putting in your full name, just so that we know who we're speaking to, it will be great. Uh, but before we hand over to KB, I just wanted to see if Professor Correa or Tahir um, had anything specific uh, that they'd like to respond to in relation to the presentation from Alex as well as from you and, and Sangeeta. Professor Correa? Yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, well, yes, uh, I would like to uh, to make a couple of comments on uh, Alexander's presentation. Uh, well, I think he has made an excellent presentation of one of the possibilities that uh, members of the WTO can use. Uh, they don't need a permission. This is a right which is already in the TRIPS agreement to act in case of an international emergency. As he said, the South Center actually sent a letter to the Director General of WTO, uh, WIPO, uh, the World Organization, at the very beginning of the uh, of the COVID-19 crisis, indicating that they should should support uh, the use of this uh, this um, emergency exception, um, in particular by developing countries. So, in in our view, and there is also uh, a paper published by the South Center by Professor Frederick Abbott on on this exception that you may may look at. Uh, in our view, this this is a possibility, and and certainly, as you suggested, this will mean that countries individually will have to take action. But uh, if the if the waiver is not 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 adopted, unfortunately. Let's imagine whether there is a collective decision by members of WTO to use this exception. So this will allow them to create at the national level this legal certainty for companies to produce or for uh, users to import uh, products which may be eventually under, under patent protection. Um, I appreciate your analysis of the panel, uh, panel report wording. But, uh, but we, we need to be clear that, uh, in the first place, the panel decision has no precedential value. Secondly, that uh, there is a need to change the way in which panels in WTO think about uh, intellectual property, uh, because they are, they are using trade jurisprudence in order to look at intellectual property, which, as it was mentioned, is subject under the TRIPS agreement um, to Article 7 and 8, which make it clear that there is, the, there is the welfare of society, transfer of technology, and other objectives which are sought. So uh, I think this is, this is a needed change in, the, in the, the way in which WTO panels and the upper body operate. Maybe what, what is needed is a new standard of review. As you know, there is a standard of review uh, uh, in the anti-dumping agreement, WTO, the recent one for chips. Maybe it's time to develop a standard for review uh, 
of cases in the intellectual property field. Um, so this is first comment. If there is time, I'd like to make other comments, but uh, thank you again for possibility to participate. Thanks. Uh, Tyre, and, and Tyre, could you also just deal with the issue of the role of Pfizer in the, about 20 years ago, something you've spoken about before, and sort of in relation to the language that we're using of why vaccines in particular in this pandemic, which should be a public good, are even subject to the WTO rules, and you know, how do we build a movement towards decommodification? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there's uh, there's been a lot written by people like Peter Drahas, and I'm sure Dr. Correa knows about this very well. And uh, you, um, if we look back in the sort of 70s, there was uh, as as countries were emerging from sort of uh, colonialism, uh, many countries were, were trying to get back, get trying to get on the technological ladder, so to speak. There was this talk of tra tra technology transfer. In fact, there was a resolution that was at the UN General Assembly around, I think it was 1974, which to create a new international economic order. And that uh, that was really to sort of, uh, basically, you know, the, 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 the colonial countries had taken all the spoils and, and so there was this way of reparation, if you might say, to, to give these uh, countries uh, the ability to have access to the, the, the development of science and technologies that they hadn't been able to really fully um, uh, uh, have, have access to whilst they were a colonial country colonized, and so this 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 I mean it's, it's available on on, on the uh, you can search for it the new international economic order and if you look at some of the language in there it's quite telling in terms of some of the issues that we are actually fighting today, and yet uh, as that was happening uh, U.S. was one of the countries that uh, one of the issues was patents and and uh, sort of uh, not not having patent uh, uh, rights in in these countries or enforcing them and so forth. And the US uh, didn't really budge on that. And eventually the, the resolution didn't really go anywhere. And what we had though emerging at the same time was we had uh, various trade committees in the United States, which uh, were really organized by uh, Edmund Pratt, who was the CEO of Pfizer at that time. It was about 1974. And they started really bringing together various industries, in particular the copyright industries. Uh, to to really start thinking because you know we were moving into the knowledge economy and what they saw was competition coming from the uh, emerging uh, economies and uh, what they said uh, they felt threatened by that and so they started talking about how they were going to build uh, intellectual property into trade systems and that really started around the sort of seventies and, and Edmund Pratt conveniently um, positioned himself on some of these committees in the United States we started persuading the government so up until that point this was really on the radar. And uh, eventually, uh, by getting the uh, the Reagan administration on board, uh, then they started pressuring the Europeans and the Japanese, who were really big technology centers and exporters. And so eventually, they got them on board. Uh, and, and, you know, it wasn't it wasn't just a sort of straight through path. There were some disagreements in between North and North, but eventually, they all got on one side. And uh, we we, end, we ended up with a uh, sort of uh, trade uh, IP now becoming part of trade. And so come sort of like uh, Punta del Est, you know, 1996, this is all sort of happening. And I was reading the other day that uh, countries, developing countries, global south countries resisted uh, sort of for three years any talk of IP in, in the trade agreements. And, and I'm sure Dr. Craig knows this better than anyone. Um, but uh, and, 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 and here we are, we have we have the TRIPS agreement. So what you have is, is you have this demand to create a new political economy of technology in the 70s where that countries could actually find their way and, and climb the ladder if you want to say if you want to use uh, the economic development speak of uh, but what the what the what the what the west larger did was to kick away that ladder you know it's, it's that kind of classic work that uh, uh you know uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a, there's a book by a, a korean economist who's who's written about this um about sort of kicking away the ladder it's like you climb the ladder and then you tell these other countries not to do what you did, uh, to do it the other way around, and and, and eventually uh, you're, you're, we're stuck. And this is what we're in. And I think this is the back to the the language and the conversation that I think it's important we now really start speaking about these these histories and these these stories, because they they are largely lost. And it's, it's it's kind of almost revealing when you sit in these panels and you you speak to members of, from the U.S. or the European. They speak as though there there is no such history. And that they just landed in this technological development by sort of uh, you know by their own design and by their their, their great uh, 
sort of skill set. No, it was it, the rules were set for them, and they and they and they chopped and changed as they wished. They got the chance to experiment, um, as, as Dr. Correa mentioned. That you know Switzerland, uh, Italy didn't have patent laws until you know very recent, uh, at least in terms of uh, you know the seventies. And so it's it's uh, it's it's important to look at that history and the conversations we have today. And in a way, you know, it's taken this catastrophic situation of the pandemic to to really start bring this up. And this is what I mean by what I was trying to refer to in my my comments earlier about the language. Is it's like it's taken us to hit this rock bottom to really go back to. So I mean, we've come full circle, uh, and it's take we've wasted fifty years of coming full circle in that sense. And uh, and I'm sure you know. Naturally, there's political powers, and you know we can't. We have to operate within the, the sort of the systems that then get pushed pushed down on us. But I think this is an important time moment to actually change that. And the other thing I wanted to mention um, uh, was something that's come up, which uh, Dr. Graham mentioned and, and uh, Sangeetha mentioned, was um, the issue of uh, it's not just about patents and trade secrets. What's telling is, is if you listen, if you look at some of the, you know, we've I've done I've done a lot of looking at patents, and particularly in the biologic space. And one of the big issues there is, is that actually many of these patents uh, don't reveal how to actually make that invention, which is a social contract of the patent system is you in order to get that exclusivity, you you will actually disclose. And then once it goes off patent, you then uh, sort of it's, it can be publicly worked. But uh, even uh, Stefan Bansel, the uh, Moderna uh, CEO, actually said, oh, you can't even if you have the patent when they did that patent waiver, uh, which was really a, a PR stunt. Is is that basically you could even make the vaccines even with the patents, um, and so uh, and and I think Afrigen, who's now trying to work with on the hub, have, have looked at these patents very closely and said actually they're very carefully worded and, and obfuscate uh, uh, deliberately so that someone can't actually make it, which then begs the question then do we really have a patent system the way it was actually designed to be, um, and I think this is again back to this there's this 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 kind of like a, this you know uh, Hugh mentioned that you know IP ideologues I think well. There's, a, there's this, there's this idea, you know, ideologue on the other side as well that, that the patent system still is what it was 200 years ago, 100 years ago. No, it's actually become a financialized tool. It's got so many other influences and factors uh, that actually it's not the what it was actually idealized to be. And I think we have to uh, really push that point too and, and make better cases for showing showing why what, what they believe was to be the, the, the sort of perfect system or the best system as, as some people say, out of all the choices that we have, is actually not what it used, what they thought it was to be. The world has changed, and it's definitely not what they, uh, uh, the, the founding uh, sort of principles uh, are today. Thanks, Tyre. Um, we're going to ask a guest called KB. I still can't see the name to be able to ask their question because I think the chat box may be disabled for guests. So KB, if you can hear me, you are welcome to ask your question. Um, maybe while we wait for that to happen, uh, I think two things that, that have emerged from just some of the input from uh, the, Dr. Correa and, and Tahir, and, and maybe Sangeeta, you can answer this, is that a lot of people are saying, well, what now? How do we get unstuck? How do we you know, deal with this imperfect system that we've now inherited? through um, not not the system we wanted, but how do we shift the dial or the needle in relation to the TRIPS waiver and how much longer do we wait uh, for the EU to continue blocking access because people literally are getting sick and dying. Um, and so just maybe some of your thoughts on, on the voting possibility um, or potentially even a partial waiver in phases because there's some talk around given what the US did, which obviously many people think was deliberate, was to split the waiver into three. Uh, so if you could just give us some some thoughts on on how we actually get unstuck uh, so that we can scale up manufacturing, given I think the announcements today, which certainly seem to be pushing more towards the direction of pharmaceutical industry control and voluntary action as opposed to actually sharing technology through a broad TRIPS waiver or sharing even technology through the WHO hubs that have been set up. So, Sangeeta? So, it's a difficult question to answer, how to get unstuck. I think it's really uh, the amount of pressure we can put on the EU, uh, you know, to 
to do what is right, what it has promised from this very beginning, right? You promised solidarity, beautiful words of solidarity, international cooperation. You know, we, you know, this is about humanity. You know, Third World Network has a whole video <laughs> on, on this, actually. And, you know, it is the, really the EU that has been blocking for one year. I think the developing countries have to come together, uh, have to stay firm on, on what they want out of this process. And uh, WTO has to deliver on this because if WTO cannot deliver on this really crucial issue, uh, then, you know, it would have failed to actually deliver any kind of uh, credible solution. So I think um, we have to increase the pressure up on um, the EU and a lot of the developed countries that are opposing. And I, we have seen some great successes, you know, we, at one point, um, Canada was quite vocal against it and Australia, uh, and we have seen them actually change their, you know, um, how they approach uh, the, the issue of TRIPS waiver uh, in, in the negotiations. So I think, I think, and even New Zealand as well, right? So I think it's really uh, putting a pressure on these countries um, to do what is the right thing to do. Uh, WTO, in, on term, in terms of the voting, I think um, WTO generally takes decisions by consensus. Uh, voting is not normally done, although it's there in, you know, it is there in the um, uh, Article 9 of the Marrakesh Agreement, the possibility of voting. So I think this is a call the TRIPS waiver co-sponsors have to take at the appropriate time, if that is the way to go. Uh, I don't know about this trips waiver in phases. Uh, you know, th this kind of negotiations are difficult. We already spent one year discussing this. So it makes no sense just to have a waiver on vaccines. Uh, if you look at the uh, emphasis that uh, even um, US um, government is putting on therapeutics, uh, the importance of a test and treat strategy to get out of the pandemic, you know, with, with this um molnupiravir uh, being considered although we don't have the full data that you know considered to have some kind of potential for a test and treat strategy that means to say you test yourself and within five days you know you take the uh, pill if it works you know then you are out of um uh, you will not be in, you will not be infected by covid 19 so i think there are all these possibilities it does not make sense for us to just go for a um a limited waiver, really. You know, if we really want to contain the pandemic, we really do need vaccines, we need therapeutics, and we definitely need diagnostics. And we would also need the other tools, uh, you know, because at the end of the day, you need PPEs and you need other health technologies as well. So uh, there is right now, as far as I know, no talk of this uh, waiver in phases. And uh, our experience in the WTO is, you know, if you have spent one year negotiating this, there is no more phases to it. I think we should really push for a real meaningful outcome as we're heading towards the end of the year. Thanks. Thanks, Sangeeta. There is a comment or a question from Gabriela Hertag. There are calls to postpone the MC12 uh, because not all country representatives will be able to attend because of COVID. Uh, so I, I think you can see that in the chat. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that, uh, but also while you're thinking of that, could we also perhaps you get your reflections on, you know, the presentation from Alex um, relating to some of the other mechanisms that potentially could be used and and how we advance IP scholarship in a in a very different, more progressive way. Um, and maybe you know if you could just reflect. I mean, you know. Dahir Sangeeta and myself and, and obviously Dr. Correa have been doing this uh, for many years in, in another crisis as well on HIV AIDS. And, and one of the unusual things has been just the overwhelming support for the TRIPS waiver proposal actually from even the Vatican, and former heads of state and faith leaders and you know everybody's talking about TRIPS and the waiver and IP. Uh, and that is unusual, and so uh, including IP uh, academics to you know to have a hundred people sign on to a letter uh, for us is quite significant. Um, so maybe if you could just reflect on on how did that come about? Like what what has been the shift, and how do we take advantage of that momentum? I think uh, going forward, so that it's not just left to the South Centre and Third World Network. Uh, 
and IMEF to be, you know, advocating for this and pushing this agenda going forward. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll just take your questions in order and Fatima, I just wanted to say also just technically I can't see the chat box, so um, it, it might be my interfaces problem, but I just wanted to flag it before I answer. So um, Alex, I found your presentation really interesting and I think the Article 73, I mean, I think a lot of trade lawyers have actually pointed out to the to the possibility of activating Article 73 and then it's there, right? I mean, it's not something that is you know, extra extraneous or additional to the TRIPS agreement. It, it's been there. The question is, um, does it really, does the present pandemic um, present an essential security situation? And I think when we look at what the, what the, um, what states have done, so let's think about the activation of DARPA in the US jurisdictional context. It is precisely for a defense um, essential security situation that that this the DARPA has been activated in order to um, develop vaccines to um, to put certain things into place that would normally in normal situations be not be possible. So I think when we just think about what has been actually done in different jurisdictions, including certain kind of constitutional um, amendments in order to put certain lockdown situations etc in place, I'm thinking about Germany right now. Um, I think there is a strong kind of empirical case to be made that Article 73 actually would not be something so extraordinary in, in current situation, in the pandemic situation, because um, I think this is the most extraordinary international situation we've been in since the Second World War. Um, so I think that case could, in historical and empirical grounds, be actually be made. Um, in terms of what is going on um, with IP scholarship and the public awareness of what IP law does, I think um, I've been really surprised myself and I think it's, um, it, I, it, I think it actually just kind of reactivates the work that has been done by activists um, during the AIDS crisis and by the South Centre as well as other academics um, who have been doing continuous work on this, um, especially at the intersection of access to health. So I'm thinking about Amy, Amy Kaczynski's work, um, James Love's work, etc. But I think what is actually quite novel in the present situation is that there is a financial, um, a global financialization, which has actually perhaps been, um, which has progressed much more than let's say 20 years ago, um, in the sense that the TRIPS has also facilitated or the WTO has facilitated and what I mean by that is that IP has become an object of global trade. So in that sense, it's been really commodified as, a, as an asset, as, a, as an international asset to be traded. But also on the other hand, what's really interesting is when you look at the professional discussions of IP asset funders and management professionals is that IP is an inherently very, very risky and unstable asset class. So there is a very interesting disconnect between IP investment <laughs> investment um, professionals um, who are, you know, trading IP and IP portfolios and valuing them, and IP lawyers and trade lawyers um, who are treating IP as if it's something very, very fixed. So um, how do I explain this? It's so there's this. There are two very extreme understandings of IP. That IP is a monopoly and blocks everything, and that's something what we're seeing in the present pandemic context. But also on the other hand, IP is something which is very constructed and made and historically contingent. Um, the value of which really hinges upon the political practices around it. Um, and, and and these are the two extremes which I'm seeing at the moment. On the one hand, IP is risky. It can, you know, like most of IP or patents are not valuable, but then there are the key IPs which really block everything. Um, and and I think that's, that's something which is quite interesting to explore further in the future. But, um, but generally, I feel that I think IP scholars have been quite happy, um, you know, leading a quiet life. But I think what the pandemic has really shown is that you can actually not. I think the the silence is also taking one kind of position, and um, and I think the scholars are waking up to that fact that um, we're not we're not in an ivory tower in that sense. Thanks. Okay, so it seems we've figured out.
notes, and it was Kajal all along from the ICJ, who's asked that the panel has highlighted the role of developed countries and big pharma, but what are their reflections on the role of international institutions like WIPO, WHO? Um, and then she talks about the study that has just come out um, from all three institutions, uh, providing commentary, including on the waiver, which she says is pretty disingenuous. Um, and then there's a second question from Goddard Kimani. Um, are there concerns that some developing countries may have also included IIAs that make trips flexibilities difficult to access? Are there concerns that they could be used to constrain IP policy choices with respect to public health? We do have 20 minutes left, so what I'm going to do um, is ask the panel to reflect on both questions and we'll go in the order of um, Dr. Correa, and then Alex, Hyo, Tahir, and then Sangeeta. Thanks. Okay, well, uh, on, on the first question on the role of international organizations, uh, in fact, uh, the leadership of the World Organization has uh, taken position in favor of the waiver and has also denounced the, the shameful situation of uh, unequal distribution of vaccines. The problem with the World Health Organization is that they, they haven't had the tools in order to implement a different policy and ensure the distribution of vaccine was made on the basis of solidarity, which was proclaimed but not practiced, and uh, particularly on the basis of uh, equality in access. Regarding the second question, uh, that's an important issue. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to refer again to another paper by the South Center, but uh, two colleagues of mine and myself, we wrote a paper on this issue, alerting that it may be possible in case the waiver is adopted, it is implemented, that um, companies may use the so-called investor rights under investment protection agreements in order to challenge decisions, for instance, and not to enforce a patent. So this is something that it would be important for countries to uh, look at if the waiver is adopted or if the, the, the solution is found in terms of Article 773B. And if you just allow me one additional minute, uh, in addition to what has been uh, noticed by, by Sangeeta, their speakers, on the impact of the, uh, the waiver um, internationally, one important outcome is that uh, now the, the legitim legitimacy of compulsory license does not seem to be questioned anymore by the European Union, even if you look at the last uh, special special section 301 report by the United States, which usually contain uh, attacks on uh, against countries that had compulsory license system. In the last 2021 report by the USDR, there is no reference at all to compulsory licensing. So that's some progress in terms of uh, recognizing that this is a legitimate tool. And finally, uh, know-how was mentioned is important. There is, a, there is a suggestion by, uh, by a scholar, in particular Olga Gurgula, that compulsory license could be granted also in relation to know-how. This is something that would be very interesting to have a far discussion uh, among uh, the scholars, whether this, this, how this might be possible. But certainly th that's another alternative we need to look at. And, and finally, uh, as it was also mentioned by Sangita, there is capacity in developing countries to produce more vaccines even to develop know-how in order to do that, uh, such as including messenger RNA technology. The only problem is that it takes time. So what we, what the world is looking is to accelerate access to technology, but otherwise this technology may be developed, but it will take time and an emergency, you need to act fast. And this is essentially the problem we, we are facing. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you're right, because all of a sudden compulsory licenses is now being thrown in our face as the solution when, you know, I live in a country when we were put on a trade watch list for even mentioning the word compulsory license. Um, so, uh, Alex, over to you. Uh, thanks, Fatima, and um, thank you for, for the questions as well. Um, so I think let's perhaps just start very quickly with, with Kimani Goddard's question there on IIAs. Um, I think the answer to that question is yes, there are definitely concerns um, about uh, investment agreements uh, and, you know, loosely uh, worded provisions on fair and equitable treatment, for example, or something like this. You know, there are lots of standards in, in investment agreements that are open to fairly, you know, uh, broad interpretation. And it's not inconceivable to me that 
uh, you know, dispute settlement bodies under different uh, investment agreements could potentially come to the conclusion that there's been a violation of those obligations, for example. Uh, it's, of course, a very ad hoc kind of uh, issue because investment agreements are very different from one another. You know, it'll come down to the specific wordings and the specific remedies allowed by different uh, agreements and, and so forth. Uh, but I definitely think that it is a concern um, and it's, it's one that, that I haven't really seen much mention of. So that's a good point. Um, as to, to Kajal's question, I, I think I think this. I'll probably bring this back to to Carlos's uh, well, Carlos's point about how panels should go about interpreting uh, the TRIPS agreement, for example. And you know, I completely agree with that. Um, and I think, in general, panels are sort of inclined to interpret agreements in the WTO quite narrowly. The, the same is true of the appellate body. Um, but I think there's also, you know, one must give WTO uh, staff, and I mean the secretariat staff you know, uh, one must give them the due as well, because it's difficult to work in an organization that's member driven, it, because sometimes you release a report, and this is what happened in the case of the appellate body, for example, um, that the US does not like, and then it threatens to, you know, pass a law domestically that says, you know, if there are three decisions, and this is an, an actual example, if there are three decisions that go against us, we're withdrawing from the WTO, right? Um, and so I think, you know, there are serious constraints on the institutions themselves, sort of the, the secretariats, not the members, uh, when it comes to to sort of, you know, reflecting um, or sort of honestly speaking what they think. And yeah, I think there are serious constraints there that one should give probably some weight to. Um, when it comes to producing of reports uh, by panels or research reports and so forth, uh, because every time you, you release something, you do so to a membership of 160 odd countries. Uh, and the, you know, if, if the countries don't like it, then they constrain your power. For example, they will block uh, appellate body members from being appointed because they don't like the decisions that the appellate body uh, makes. So when we talk about WIPO, the WHO and the WTO, should remember that there is, you know, a secretariat, sure, but it's ultimately a member-driven organization, and there's a lot of power politics that inform how the institutions themselves behave. Uh, and I think we should not forget that. So yeah, that's basically my take on that. Thanks. So so basically, we will be hostages to power politics and geopolitics, and we'll um, just get the sick and die potentially. Um, Ty, do you want to respond to that? I, I, I think I forgot the order. I'm so sorry, Alex. So I, I don't know who was meant to be after you. It, it could be Tahir or Hyo or Sangeeta, but I'll leave it to the three of you to decide. I think it was Hyo. Sorry, Hyo. No, put you on the spot. <laughs> I can go first, Tahir, actually. I just, um, I, okay, maybe I'll just make two, two brief points. The first one is that I think the member states um, to all of the IOs have to think about what they are actually legally entitled to do. And I think there has been a lot of timidity and of course, based on past experiences of, um, of bail threats and so on, um, to be careful. But I think um, what the pandemic has shown, and as uh, Dr. Correa has also pointed out, compulsory license is something which now the EU is actively pushing for, right? So. Um, I think the, the policy space available to the member states um, should be explored and could be explored. And I think there is a lot of solidarity within the member states to do that. Um, the second thing I think is uh, going beyond what the law says and does and what it allows. I think it's really important to actually explore the collaboration of international scientists beyond what the legal framework allows or not. Um, I think what has been really interesting in this particular pandemic is how the scientists have actually kept um, quiet and have actually sided with the side of private capital rather than international public science scientific ideals. And um, especially thinking about data and copyright, I think what would be interesting is to explore to what degree developing countries and also developed countries could do in order to counter the increasing privatization of scientific knowledge. Thanks. Um, well, 
yeah, I mean, to maybe reflect on that and also just how we got into a situation where scientists agreed to do clinical trials um, without necessarily guaranteeing, you know, equitable post-trial access. Well, I think, I, I mean, he has already mentioned the, the, the whole sort of privatization of science has been uh, really driven by the United States. I think it goes back to sort of the 50s of uh, uh, not wanting AIDS. To, to, to be seen, you know, in the Cold War, the whole sort of debate about uh, public science versus private science really got fought out in the 50s. Um, I think there's a great book that really describes that, uh, Pills, Power and Policy uh, by Dominique Tobel, which really captures that, that sort of whole era and why we are where we are today in terms of uh, the sort of privatization of science. But I wanted to jump quickly to the, um, the comment about, I haven't read the trilateral study, but having read various other studies that uh, have been made and, 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 and we first have to applaud how the WHO has really stood up and tried to uh, bring up the issue of uh, inequity and, and, and vaccine um, distribution. But uh, this goes back to my in, initial talking point about uh, or the language that others have used of decolonizing global health. Our institutions are in desperate need of reform. And I think uh, that's one of the things that really needs to happen here is, is how our institutions are run. And that includes the WTO. Uh, it, 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 it kind of beggars belief that you have a system like the WTO, which uh, even though there is the voting potential, but that's the nuclear option, that you have a handful of countries that can really decide how the rest of the world operates. Um, it's kind of remarkable that uh, you have the global north countries uh, trying to preach a good global governance to many countries, and yet you have a system that they have created, an architecture, which allows them and a few to really determine uh, the direction of, 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 of how, how they are supposed to take on these challenges. So for me, you know, even even within the WHO, I'm sure we've all worked with various people within the WHO, there are sort of, uh, of course, every institution has different voices and different opinions, but I, I think it comes back to the language and, and how everything has been sort of co-opted in terms of like everyone has to speak from a particular sort of script uh, and if, if you don't then you know you get your funding pulled or you get this pulled or that pulled or this pressure and I, I really think we need to have a real uh, debate about what these institutions are supposed to stand for um, and, and, uh, and, and I, I hope I think and this is this is where I think we, what, what concerns me is we don't go back to business as usual once we sort of uh, results of these issues. I don't think we will. I don't. Th I think this has left a, a, a huge scar on all of us. And I think uh, it's it, the unpacking of this is, is going to take decades. But um, I think it's an important opportunity now to really sort of uh, keep the teachings going. I mean, one thing about I IP, uh, which Bill was saying, is I feel like we've, we've had the biggest classroom we've ever had to teach about IP and access to medicine. So I, it's unfortunate that it's happening at a time like this. But uh, the fact that people actually even know that the WTO exists is a remarkable achievement. Yeah, and, and the fact that people are calling on richer nations to do the right thing and the WTO to do the right thing is, is also significant. Sangeeta, you're going to have uh, the last few minutes before we wrap up. Um, and, and, you know, I think we need to ask you how we push back against the EU counter proposal, right? Um, and sort of some of your thoughts around not just the the political relevance of that very bizarre proposal. I mean, I think bizarre is an understatement. Uh, but Professor uh, Dr. Correa talked about it earlier in terms of you know this invocation of compulsory licensing as a solution, and that's that's been going on since February 2021 when members uh, of the EU delegations were saying to countries, "Well, sort out your own domestic laws, and you know just get a compulsory license." and nobody will block you and I mean obviously it's not true given what's happening in in Canada with BioLease and Johnson & Johnson but just some of your thoughts on outside of the WTO uh, institution and mechanism and the reforms that Ty is talking about and, and others on the panel how do we uh, as a community of IP progressive IP lawyers human rights lawyers uh, activists deal with the EU proposal that's uh, you know a position is a counter to the waiver and that is now on the table. Sorry, you muted. Uh, sorry, Sangeeta. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to address uh, uh, three points actually before I come to the EU uh, question. I think the first point, which is just in the chat uh, about this um, this letter by civil society to calls to postpone the MC12. So the 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 ministerial conference, there are several development issues um, at stake, uh, and I think the challenge for developing country delegations is travel. In a lot of countries, there are no flights available because of the COVID disruptions. Uh, virtual negotiations are difficult and and some of these countries are not properly adequately represented in, in Geneva, you know, so these are all issues and often these vaccines are not even recognized, isn't it? So we know, I think it's not fully clear whether, you know, the countries that have been vaccinated with Sinovac and Sinopharm and, you know, um, Bharat Biotech's vaccine, co-vaccine, whether they would be recognized by the Swiss authorities. So I think all of these issues, we have seen a letter by civil society calling for the postponement. But this does not this does not necessarily this does not impact the trips waiver because the trips waiver decision can be taken by the general council at any time. Actually, 98% of the waivers, uh, the decisions have been taken by the general council. So just to mention highlight that point. Uh, on the um, free trade agreements and investment, I want to just mention that. When we look at intellectual property, intellectual property rights are not absolute. They are always subject to exceptions, limitations, and this is the context of the waiver. You know, the waiver is a legal provision that is provided for the for the WTO, which is to be used in exceptional circumstances. And this is what this exceptional circumstances. Uh, the pandemic is such a circumstance, and we have seen in this global pandemic, governments governments take, you know, incredibly unprecedented measures to control, right? Lockdowns, privatization of hospitals. And I and addressing the IP barrier should be really no different because at the end of the day, uh, we all benefit, uh, you know, by bringing an early end to the global pandemic, right? Uh, because we see as, you know, the IMF uh, uh, chief has spoken that, you know, it's almost as if we have uh, pebbles in our stone and we, you know, we are hobbling along uh, recovery with, with the stones in our shoes. So I think uh, we really, it's in everybody's interest for us to recover. So for me, it's a no brainer. And I think the TRIPS waiver will send this international signal, which would discourage such uh, disputes um, brought about under those international agreements. But at the end of the day, whether and how to implement a waiver would be a national decision. And that is why the co-sponsors have pushbacks against you know, very strict conditionalities as to how it should be implemented. Because even if you look at artic the TRIPS agreement, Article 1 of the TRIPS agreement is very clear that it's up to each country to decide how to implement the TRIPS agreement. So there is no reason it should be very prescriptive when it comes to the waiver decision. So uh, every country has a different context. And I think a waiver that should allow uh, for countries to implement it uh, nationally. Uh, on know-how, I just want to mention that there's often this uh, thinking uh, that manufacturers in developing countries need significant handholding. And I think uh, there are different capacities um, in developing countries with respect to manufacturing. And in some uh, countries, uh, for instance, just to mention India, there is some significant vaccine manufacturing uh, capacity. When we talk about know-how, the challenge is really uh, linked to intellectual property issue is the regulatory pathway. Currently, there is no separate regulatory pathway for follow-on manufacturers to enter the market. And so the, the manufacturers would have to uh, redo phase three clinical trials. This takes time, money, effort. Uh, this is done with their find patients. And as you know, more people are vaccinated, that becomes even more uh, difficult. And so the, the current challenge is that for any follow-on to enter the market, they would have to closely almost uh, do the exact same process as the originator. And as we have mentioned, you know, this is protected as trade secret, right? Even in the regulatory dossiers, these are all protected as confidential information. So this is uh, the challenge that we are facing. But we foresee, and WHO has done this, they, they tend to, over time, uh, come out with what we call ICP, immuno, immuno, immune correlate protection. These are like the endpoint markers that a vaccine would have to meet to enter the market without having to do phase three clinical trial. So once we address the IP barrier, uh, then, and once WHO has developed the ICP for 
COVID-19, a lot of these manufacturers should be able to enter the market. I just wanted to uh, put that, you know, so this is where the, the link between IP and the regulatory system comes. I think with respect to the EU, my final point, um, the EU, the EU proposed a declaration. This was mentioned by Hugh. Uh, they proposed a declaration that, um, I think this was in June or July, they proposed a declaration which just restated um, all the flexibilities that we are aware and on which there is no dispute. And, you know, if you and challenge, uh, you would say, we have to look at it in the context of the other proposals on trade and health. So they themselves kind of realize there's no value to their their proposals. Uh, now we have seen in the last two weeks, uh, you you know there's some leaks leak tax in in Huffington Post, and you may be open to a waiver, uh, but I think more has to be done to put pressure on the EU, uh, and you know even going through the European Union member states to query the Commission because this position is taken by the European Commission. Uh, why it's taking this position, you know, and why is it, delay, you know, employing all sorts of uh, tactics to delay and derail the TRIPS waiver proposal. And I think uh, it is really a challenge for the civil society uh, globally, uh, you know, to, to uh, get the commission uh, to act, act in good faith, because so far the commission has acted in quite bad faith, uh, you know, from all its different discussions. So I think this is a challenge we should take on. A uh, time is short. Uh, you, you really want me to see a meaningful outcome by the, you know, before the end of MC12. Thank you very much. So huge thank you to all of our panelists. I think we could speak for another three hours, but we all have to go respond to Pfizer and Dinner's announcements and various other blockages to the waiver. Um, so really deep appreciation and thanks also for all of your work in advancing this field and for pushing for the waiver to try and get access to life-saving technologies in the global south. So uh, uh, Dr. Correa, thank you so much, Alex, Tahir, Yo, and, and Sangeeta, much appreciated. The recordings for all three webinar um, uh, the, as part of the series will be on our website. One and two is already up and today's one will be up within the next week. So. Just want to say thank you and also to the team. This is the final one in the series of three. So just want to say a special thanks to Magda, Althea, Alex, Rafia, uh, Feroz, who, uh, who had to leave early but wanted to convey his thanks. He's the head of the Mandela Institute, Feroz Kachalia, and myself from, from the HAI. So really appreciate it. Thank you. And we will be continuing these conversations. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.